Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 21st of the third month, which happens to line up with June 1st, 2024 on our, on our, <laughs> on the Gregorian calendar, sorry, um, at least for our comprehension of how our creator's calendar actually works. If anyone has any questions on that, by the way, we've we have a few videos in the scripture studies on the topic of how to determine when the, the year begins based only on scripture, not doing things that we want to in our own mind. And then the uh, how the calendar works and why you, you should not intercalate. We've done two videos on that and gone over what is in the word in regards to how it actually functions. So we don't claim to have everything or to be all knowing or all powerful or anything of that nature, right? We do believe that we've honestly found what is true, that where we don't have to add to or take away or, or make up our own things in our mind on what to do. There's no looking for signs and omens from other people and, and wicked apostate heathen people that don't believe in the truth, right? You don't have to follow anything that they're doing. If you just listen to what's in his word, and we tried to cover that as best as possible, but we're always willing to talk about things if anyone wants to share. That being said, we are continuing with our reading of Bereshit or Genesis, finishing up the narrative of our ancestors and their migrations through the land of Canaan and eventually going into Mitzrayim or Egypt which was foretold to Abram by Yahuwah, our Mashiach, if you remember, where he said for 430 years, he, or for 400 years, his seed would be afflicted in a land not their own, counting Canaan, starting with uh, when Yitzhak was five years old and being weaned, and how he was mocked by Yishmael. That was the persecutions that began and for 400 years happened through Canaan into Egypt or Mitzrayim until the liberation with Moshe and Yahuwah bringing them out to the Mount Sinai. <clears throat> so exactly as he said, so it was done, right? Another thing we got to keep in mind. But right here we have the children conspiring against their brother, allowing the deceiver and the enemy of the truth to turn their hearts away from what is right and sell their brother into slavery. He's been suffering persecution. He was serving and then had to overcome the lusts of an adulterous woman. And for his reward of keeping chaste, he was put into prison. But he rejoices at that. And you'll find out more about that in his testament. <clears throat> and this is chapter 40. It says, and it came to pass, or well, yeah, he, and it, and it came to be, or and it was, achar, after the things or the matters of these, right, that offended him, right, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt, right, sorry, of the king of Egypt, and the baker unto their master it's literally unto the add-on of them the hey mem at the end or a mem just by itself means them as a suffix i don't know all the nuances of the hebrew but even within what we call the bible in the the Stones Tanakh or the Old Testament, if you will, the original covenant writings from the Masoretic texts, you have the language itself changing over time. So if you pay attention, if you ever do study the Hebrew and you look at how it was originally written with Bereshit and Exodus, and then you move on towards the times of the Kings and Chronicles, the writing styles of the Hebrew was slightly different. The, some of the wording and the way things were phrased was slightly different. And it was still shifting over time to the into the times of Ezra and the coming of our Mashiach even, where they had other influences and different ways of speaking. 
So I can't say that it's always hey mem or just a mem if that was a thing for one time or another. Okay. I, I cannot answer all those questions. But I do know it's a phenomenon that, that happens. And we've looked at the, when you consider the things like the, the creation account parable, and when you can break down words and how they mean and what they line up with, these principles also fit. So while a word right here, like Ms. Mizraim, or Mizraim, right, for Egypt is plural there, Yod Mem, the word was uh, someone's name. But this is also for Egyptians. The Mitzriite is an Egyptian. And then when you have the Mem, it's plural. When you break it down as a word, as is done by Alexander Hislop in the two Babylons, it's the confiner or the confinement, the one who confines the waters. And he uses broken down etymologies of things like that quite often too for another witness to the legitimacy of that kind of thing. It's not something that I'm, I'm personally making up. It was something that was discovered and made known and I learned from others. Alexander Hyssop was over 100 years ago in the 1800s. And another brother that we, some of you may all be familiar with is Eric Bissell, who came to these discoveries from studying and he also had learned from another gentleman who teaches these things um, from a different perspective, but his name is Isaac Moseson, and he is a Yahudi, or he calls himself a Jew, I believe, um, who wrote the book Origin of Speeches, which I don't agree with all of his all of his ideas in there, but the facts, the evidence of the where the language and words come from are undeniable and it's amazing information so highly recommend those for anybody if you need evidence for the legitimacy of looking at the hebrew in such a manner okay <clears throat> this is and he was anger and was angry pharaoh with or upon the two of his officers upon the prince of the cupbearers and upon the prince or the chief of the bakers. Let's see, it, it says of the and plural here, which is why I put that, but it just is the baker. However, if it's the chief baker, he's over others, right? So I'm not sure why they make the English does not accurately carry that over. Maybe it does in some translations. So he put, <clears throat> this word is like Nathan, but you put the yod in front of it and is he will or he is. So wa yatan is and he, he put or he gave, right? And he gave them into the custody of the house of the prince of the guards to the house of the prison, the place which Yahusuf was confined or Asor, bound, imprisoned, right? And the place where Yahu, or Yahusuf was confined there. Remember, Shem means there. It also means here, right? There. Sorry, we can, this is one of the things about the breakdown of a word. We've talked about this one before in the group. I don't know if we've ever done it on a video. But when people talk about the name of Yahuwah, it means where he's at, literally there. But it also means a name. It also, right, it's the oldest son of Shem, that's not what it is, but it's the name, right? It doesn't have that. Oh, perhaps it's in the, the definitions themselves. Hmm. So you really have to look into them more now because this doesn't do it justice. But here we go. You have byword, defamed, defames. So for a name, it's also to defame or fame. It is your renown or what you are known for, your repute, right? 
that's the essence of what Hashem is. It's there. It's what he's known for, where he's at. <clears throat> and that is all that Yahuwah is because it is he who causes it to be the existing one who is and makes it happen. That is where he's at, who he, who he is, and his renown. So these things are very important for us to regard. And all of that is inclusive when we think about his Shem. It's not just one thing in it, but it's all of those together. Reputation and character, yes. But, and that's why it can un unequivocally say in the Apostolic Constitutions, for example, where the doctrine of Yahuwah is, there Yahuwah is present. I'm sorry, just a moment. I'm having difficulties here with my screen share. All right. Sorry about that. So again, you can see there's a little bit of differences in the wording there of what was used, but we'll go ahead and get on with it. And it says, so he put them in custody. We got that. And it says, and charged, right? Why ye pakad? That word Pakad is to attend, visit, muster, or appoint. Remember, related to the visitation, when you have Pakada, it's his visitation, and the Pakad is also his per, his overseers, right? It's the words for the judges over synagogues in the original covenant times, or the or the overseers there, and it's the word that they would use for uh, pres presumably the overseers of the apostolic times, the ones who show forth the visitation of the Almighty and what will happen during those times. But it says, and he appointed the prince of the guard, Eth Yahusuf, with them. That's that Aleph Tau Mem. So you can see the Aleph Tau being used as with, which we've talked about. Uh, Ith would be Aleph Tau, and then it was mushmouthed by the paganized Germans, specifically Ephraim, in Madai in Persia, in that area, some time between the first Germanic sound shift where they were speaking what we'd call Gothic and the later Germanic sound shifts where they were coming into Europe with the times of Woden or Odin. And you had the words like wood and other things where it was making a W for letters that had the Aleph and the Ayan. This is the perfect example. With them is exactly where they would get that phrase, with, and then the mem as a suffix means them. Okay. <clears throat> but it says, and he served them or with them. So they were, or, and it came to be, or, and so it was, days. They say a while, but yamim is literally days. You have yam is day and then plural. So, and so there were days in custody, right? And had a dream. That's why ya chalamu or chalam, chalamu, right? And he dreamed him, literally is what that means, a dream. And he dreamed him a dream, the two of them, each man his dream in the night, achad, one. So they had, each man had the same dream, okay? And it was in the night, okay? And with its own interpretation. This is pithron, interpretation. Okay. It says the dream of the cupbearer and the baker, who or which the king 
of Egypt or Mitzrayim who can find them in the house of the prison, right? Or in the house of confinement, right? And he came to them. Sorry, the Aleph Lamed, it means El, right? It's Aleph Lamed, like Elohim, mighty one. But when it's, it can also mean two, like Yahuwah Amar El Moshe or Yahuwah Debar El Moshe, right? He spoke to Moshe. It's like that written in a few different places. And they have El with a Sere. This one is a, uh, a half vowel because it's pluralized and it has them connected to it. But anyways, it can also mean to, as speaking to or sending to. It's a direction towards or a movement, right? So, and he came to them, Yahusuf, in the morning or in dawn, with the dawn, and he saw them, right? And saw that they were sad to be vexed or enraged right to be because they had these dreams they didn't know what they meant so he asked or inquired at the officers of pharaoh which were with him in the custody of the house of his master and said why ma do -o, or ma do -o, right why do you look sad? Or why do you look evil, Raim? Right? Why do you look evil or bad in the day? And they said to him, Dreams or a dream we have dreamed. That noon wa is the, the plural they have for we. It's also a plural for our. Like when we say Elohinu, Elohinu is our Elohim. But it says, and interpreter, wa petar, ein ot, a to, right? And no interpreter of it. So said to them, Yahusuf, do not belong, do not unto Elohim the interpretations. It says, tell Sefru, right? This is recount now unto me. And they told the prince of the cupbearer at his dream unto Yahusuf. And said, or Andy said, Wa Ya Omer, right? And he said unto him, In my dream, and behold, a vine before me, literally before my face. And in the vine, that word gaffin, right, is, is the word for vine. Part of the, we don't do them regularly. I was part of a fellowship before this one where they would do the prayers for the bread and wine that they would take every week in Hebrew. And they would mention the, uh, the blessing for the fruit of the vine. Hore. Peri hagafin, amen. Right, that gafin there is the vine. So, <clears throat> but it says, and in the vine were three shalisha branches, and it was as though it were budded, shot forth its blossoms, okay, and brought forth its clusters, ripe grapes. And the cup of Pharaoh in my hand, and I took, remember that word kof chet is to take possession or acquire, to, to catch hold of when it says obtain the truth and sell it not. This aleph right here is used as I am or I will. You won't find that definition, <clears throat> as far as I'm aware, in the Strong's. You won't find that definition even in the etymological dictionary of the Hebrew language by Ernest Klein. You only find the definition right here by its usage in the Hebrew and seeing how it's translated. I don't know why they it's not more clear like that. They might have other places where they go over prefixes and suffixes for that. Guinness's Hebrew grammar, for example, I don't know for certain. I can't remember off the top of my head. But as far as I'm aware, 
things of this nature, you have to learn from looking at it. The, they may have had writings, but I'm not aware of them anymore. And even things like the, the grammar that I mentioned is not so easy to get a hold of. <clears throat> but it says, And the cup of Pharaoh was in my hand, and I took at the grapes and pressed at them into the cup of Pharaoh and placed at the cup upon the hand of Pharaoh or the palm of Pharaoh. Remember, the cough, the flat or the hollow, the palm of the hand. It's not just your hand, but it's like the open palm. And he said unto him, Yahusuf, this, ze, the interpretation, all right, three branches, or three, the branches three, are the days they are. Within three days, we'll lift up Pharaoh at your head and restore you upon your place. Okay. This is literally right, vertebral, or honest. You can. That word can, remember, it's in English, it's can. Now it means can, like yes. And here it's surely, truly, thus. It, it's for sure. Right. It, let me see if they have a different definition here as well. Coon, right, vertebral, honest, right. Thus, as follows, right. So meaning it, it surely so thus, in as much. It, it's just they use it as conjunction here, but it's like a for sure thing that happened, and now they go on to explain it or declare what that thing is, right. But it says, and he will restore upon you, surely you, like truly thus it will happen. Boom. <clears throat> and he will put that word Nathan, noon tau, right? Tau, wa natata, right? And he will put or he will give the cup of Pharaoh in his hand according to the manner of the former or harishon, according to the manner, according to the judgment, the mishfat, or the right ruling, the first, or the beginning, the former, okay? It says, when you were his cupbearer, for if, that's key on, that's for if on the condition that you remember me, like as it is well with you, or when it is well with you, right? when you are tob unto you and show literally and do the deed now to me against me or by me for me i'm not right and not he's basically saying remember the kindness that i told you this remember this for me when you're brought there okay It says, now for me in kindness, right? And make mention of an hazakartanu and remember me to Pharaoh. Literally, remember, zakar is a remembrance. To remember. That's zakak, right? Zakar is remembrance or memorial. This is like his memorial name right here from Exodus 3.15 that we'll get to. Yahuwah is his Shem, Zakar, unto all generations, right? <clears throat> but it also means masculinity. There's an Israelite here. Let me see if I can find it. You see, Zakar, same spelling, means male. And it's used right there where he created them, male and female. So another thing about what Yahuwah is his Zakar, just something to keep in mind. He says, and make and remember me to Pharaoh, 
and get me out or and expel me right that's the word for like exploiting or to come out to literally to uproot and remove right to bring forth what he did to the children in egypt for example is he literally brought them out and exported them like had them cast out like to cast something off like it's dung Ugh, is what the mitzrayites did they gave them all their gold and they just just go just get away from us right because of what had happened and that's what he did for them <laughs> but he says and get me out from the house of this for indeed i was stolen away from the land of the hebrews and also here never have i done anything that should put him there that should put me here in the dungeon right be bor babor a pit cistern or well remember the last week where he was thrown into a circular thing and it was a in it was a place of a prison but it was something that was circular it also had a connotation of being dried up they probably originally did that with wells that did not become a well just like he was originally thrown into by his brothers but moving on it says and when he saw the chief or the prince of the bakers right the prince of the bakers that tove the interpretation and he said to yahusuf also i in my dream or i had a dream right and there was three baskets of white bread hare it doesn't really say white there or yeah it says hare sorry it doesn't really say bread there that's by implication it said white and it says upon my head and in the basket, the uppermost, right, ha elion, just like el elion is the el most high, ha elion is the highest or the uppermost. They have it. Okay. It says from all meakol, from all kinds for Pharaoh, the works baked. And the birds, all right, ate. He ate the kinds, if you see there's a related word, okay? But they ate at them out of the basket upon or from on my head, literally. The mem means the place of or the means through which, and I in Lamed is to be upon or on. So from on the Roshi, which is literally my head. So he answered Yahusuf and said, Zay, this is the interpretation. Three, the baskets are three days. Or, so the three days, the three baskets are three days, right? Within three days, he will lift off Pharaoh, your head, eth, your head from you, and hang you on a tree. And will eat the birds, your flesh, from you. Now, I'm going to premise here that this is something that we can prove later on. If for people who don't know, we'll see it in the course of time. But if anyone's interested, you can hop into looking in the book of Yobelim, and you'll see the writings that predated his times. The, the birds having a negative connotation here and eating up the seeds is a previous thing that his ancestor, our ancestor Abraham, lived through when he was 14 years old in the land of the Kazdim. So it's an actual narrative event. And the interpretation of the, the negative things of these birds, as opposed to the beneficial thing with the cupbearer, are what you can receive from things that already happened in their lives. The wine was a baraka from Noah. The bird, the, the birds that ate the things or like the crows were negative from that time and later on used by minions of Satan to afflict the people. So reasonable interpretations through the word might have been exactly what he was doing there. Now, I, I won't go beyond that because it doesn't explicitly say we get other places where Yahuwah, Yahushua, it goes and gives the interpretation either from his own mouth or through messengers 
he also mentions directly to Moshe that he reveals himself to his foretellers in dreams and visions. But it's to Moshe that he spoke to him as to a friend face to face. Just as he appeared to Abraham, which was our Mashiach being revealed to them by the Father. And then the Mashiach as Elohim revealing the Father to them, just as he said when he came. So the, the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? This is within three days, he will lift off Pharaoh your head from you and hang you on a tree, on an etz, a pond, etz, right? And will eat the birds your, fl eth, your flesh from you. And it came to pass on the day the third, right? In the third day of birth of Pharaoh. Okay, so yeah. And it came to pass on the right in the day the third of the day right it's the birthday of pharaoh and this is what we were talking about beforehand the allot is to begat the yaladat is the begatting so it's the remembrance of his birth right at the pharaoh that he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up at the head of the chief or the prince of the cup bearers and of the chief of the bakers among his servants. And he restored again F the prince of the cup bearers to his cup bearership. Right, to be a butler or cup bearer. And he placed the cup in the hand or palm of Pharaoh. But the prince of the bakers he hanged as as which the interpretation unto them of Yahusuf, right? And yet not remember the prince of the cupbearers at Yahusuf, but he forgot him, okay? Something to keep in mind, these things playing out in different ways, right? To forget would also come down in a way to Yahusuf's children, where he forgot his sorrows later on, and it was named in his son Manasseh, right? All right. Um, we can continue here on chapter 41. Just give me one moment. Again. All right, so here's chapter 41. And while, if you remember, the cupbearer may have forgotten, he does remember when there's a like association which also helps us, if you recall, on how we might retain or jog our memories for things. I don't know about you all, but one of the peculiar things in my life and something that I can witness to the truth of is that when I was walking in error and I was being corrected or chastised by the Almighty, just like our for our ancestor Dawid, right, he his own words came upon him the things that he said happened to him and by his own judgment he was judged if you need to know about that you can look at when nathan the foreteller came to him after the incident with bathsheba and then what parable he was given his answer and then the fruits of that not only what nathan said but then how history played out after that fact to prove the truth of those words and that judgment but anyways um we can remember things getting back on point here it helps us associate things my particular one is i had mentioned right that i was cocky and arrogant i had mentioned i would rather be dead than be a cripple i'd rather be dead than to lose my mind like the elderly and i'd rather be dead than to even have uh a missing finger, a pinky finger, right? And in the course of going from, what, 20 to 21, I think, my first year as a man, I broke my pinky knuckle on my right hand and it made the, the digit numb and somewhat useless. I herniated the discs in my back and became a cripple, literally. And 
in the course of time through vaccines and other things, my mind, my memory, literally, or um, gabapentin and things like that, sorry, my mind literally became uh, the retention, memory retention of a goldfish. And so my own words, like Dawid's, came upon me, and I was suffering the curse of, of my own judgment out of my mouth. When I later on, many years later, when I repented, I cried out to him, I started reading the scriptures, and I read the things where it says that, that what the wrong one fears comes upon him, and by your own mouth you're judged, and the other things that we've mentioned. It was a shock to my inner being. It shook me to my core, if you will, and it helped wake me up and take his word very seriously, which is the reason why I try not to lie. I, I don't steal. I don't do anything evil to the best of my ability. I literally try to do everything I know is pleasing to my maker because I know his words are true. <laughs> but I had to learn a hard way. So I share that with you all so that perhaps you can learn in an easier way. But I mention that too because for the longest time, I could not remember things. I would forget conversations I was in the middle of having. And the only way I could get things to recall to my, my memory is by talking about them. Having, I at first it was in the course of conversations with other people, just they would talk and I would remember things like that and I'd be able to spit off information that I used to know. But otherwise, I, it was just a blank screen, if you will. Eventually, Father was pleased to restore my mind. And while I still have a few hiccups here and there for everyone to witness the truth of these things, um, I'm able to retain and recall memories much more with much more clarity now. But a great way to remember stuff is through discourse and talking about it. And you can see right here even when the idea of a dream and talking about dreams and needing an interpretation came up, then the cupbearer remembered because it was an associated thought. And that kind of thing is something that every man, every being, every man, woman, child does naturally. It's in our nature. It's how we're built to function. So um, that was the whole premise of the entire uh, segue there. But it's a very important one. We are creatures that are conforming to a nature and we have ways that we learn. If you can really take hold of that, and if you really want to be frugal and do things like our Mashiach said, he said, be wise to do good. So if you can learn, for example, life hacks to get your body to function optimally, then you should do it. And if you can learn spiritual hacks to get your soul to be an optimal, you know, prime condition, then you should do it. Right. And for those reasons, intentionally, because it is being wise to do good, right? So, I'm willing we can learn and grow from these things, and you won't have to repeat my mistakes and suffer or anything like that, because it is not fun, and he is a righteous judge, I will tell you. You will get what you deserve. <laughs> Everybody does. And we either suffer in this life our inequities, or we will suffer them for eternity. There is only those two options. But back on point here, it says, and it came to pass at the end of two years or two full years, right? This is, it meant the two of them, right? Days, meaning the years of days, just so you know. Years is implied here, and these is literally the word for days again with a plural. <clears throat> but Mikuts is literally from the place of the end or release, right? It says that Pharaoh had a dream, or that Pharaoh dreamed, Wahana, and behold, he stood upon the Nile. You can see it's Heor here. It stood upon the river. It doesn't mean Nile. There, Yeor is the Nile stream or canal. That might be the original word for Nile. I'll have to look into that more, excuse me. But um, year, I believe, is a word for a river also. 
or just a normal stream. However, uh, the Nile is not the original name. It had a name just like Egypt is not the original name, but Egyptus was the name of one of the Hebrews that was there. It was named after. And Nile was a famous Hebrew that that was named after, who later traveled and migrated. And his descendants are still known today as the O'Neills of Ireland, possibly of other places too. But it says, and suddenly out of the Nile, there came up seven Shaba or Shava, okay, cows, fine or beautiful looking and fat of flesh, right, or full of flesh. And they fed among the reeds. And behold, seven cows, other or after them came up, right? It says other, achrot, right? But this is an after them came up after them. It just doesn't sound right to us. So they put it differently. But achor is another. Achar is after. And it's just the same word pronounced differently, as you can see. But it came up after them from the river or the stream, ill or sickly, evil or bad, right? Bad favored and thin. That word, remember in the um, why not to intercalate, they'll say that dok, in, if you look at the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a new translation, and you look at the commentary on the calendar information, there is some moon texts where they go through the full moon and the crescent moon. And the two words they use is dok and kadosh, right? Kadosh means renew, restore, new. And dok, as you see, we've already covered, means thin to be a thin line or weak. It's literally also a crescent. It's, it's a crescent shape in the eye for an eye disease. So, um, but they'll tell you, the scholars will tell you in the commentary there that they don't know if dok stands for a crescent or full. So it's deceptive if you just take men's words for things. However, you can come back to the truth, which is in his word here, and you can see that this dok, dalit, Kof means thin, and that does not mean full or restored, as it does with Chodesh. So a reasonable mind can see these things, and then they can look at the definitions, they can know the difference, and not be deceived. We also should keep in mind that he literally tells us that the lying pens of the scribes work falsehood. And when our Mashiach was in the flesh, he, he rebuked the scribes, amongst the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, the rich and people who were hypocrites and apostate, right? Professing to be believers in word, but not in action and for a variety of means. If anyone doesn't know how they relate to us other than in a spiritual overt, you know, the patterns fit kind of sense, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the interpretations of the foretellers, it literally calls the hypocrites and others by code name Ephraim and Menashe, and those are codes for the scribes and Pharisees of the time. Connecting those very people, their behaviors and mannerisms with what you can see in America and Britain by and large with these people. And a connection for everyone with scholars would be what you call a Jesuit, all right? What you call these doctors of divinity and scholarly men who are educated and highly esteemed amongst men but aren't teaching the truth they're lying to you <clears throat> thin small fine and they tell you they don't know what it means but i'll leave it there um dwarf 
So anyways, you see, and he's, it was bad, favored, and thin are what these cows were. So the evil and thin of flesh and stood by the other cows upon the bank of the river. And they ate up the cows, right? The heifers, ill-favored, right? And thin of flesh at the seven the cows of the fine looking so the seven thin and sickly ones ate up the seven fine ones all right the seven fine and fat ones and he awoke and he ended pharaoh right and he slept and dreamed a second time right and suddenly well and behold it is saying suddenly but hina is and suddenly they say behold in English most of the time, but it's literally hey, noon, hey. Like it's, I'm revealing, boom, like a lightning bolt, what is now evident. Seven heads of grain came up on stock one, right? So they, they came upon one stock. Berishoth, right? This is fat. The area. That's almost like um, bara. It's close to in, in creating, but it's to fill up or to become fat, right? And tov, right? Tovot. And behold, seven heads thin and blighted by the east wind, by the kadim, right? Spring up after them. This is that word I mentioned to you, that kuf dalit mem. The yod there is a, a word. It can be added or taken. You can do that sometimes with vowels. It does not take away the total essence of a word. But kuf dalit mem is that word for east. They also have as an east wind with the yod there. It also means first. We'll see here. I've told you about that. Oh, uh, Hold on. Oh, because the yod's there. I'm sorry. Let's go to Kadem first. There we go. Front. So front as in before or in front of. East and formerly as in already happened or before, right? That's the that's this word here. It's meant from the east. It means also to bore through in some places. To come or be in front right? To meet. There we go. And then um, front, east, or formerly. Eastward or toward the east. And then before, front or east, kidma, antiquity or former state. It's the, it's what's first or former revealed. Okay, or made evident, and that would be antiquity. So, obviously, you can see how the word starts to work, but this is that word, the three in one one that is used for before, first, or um, east. Just like the Greek word that you have when it comes to before the Pesach, right? It says that they have it as um, first on the first of the Pesach when it should say before. But it's the same word. I should have scrolled down more on some of them. Sorry about that. You'll have to see it later. If you you should really look into them, but if you scroll down, you can see how they're translated too. And then you'll see that they're actually translated as first in some places as well. It's not just to the east but it's generally from the east because the east is the first place that the sun or light appears, which is what all of this is in relation to. The word that we would be familiar with is orient. Your orientation, where you get your bearings for what is you know based on things, the orient is the east, which is also first. Um, It's not used in that sense anymore, but it was an archaic way of doing that, I believe. All right, so enough about that. Getting back on point here, sorry. These are the first times we're coming across these words. It's in Bereshit, but that's another thing. As you can go all the way back to the beginning, you found 
the foundation for what things are, are in the beginning. And that's how we learn its original use and how he intended it for the most part, right? Except for things that uh, we don't have full context on anymore. But you find that in the course of time with the writings that were hidden and later on revealed. If you can't find two or more witnesses in a plain explanation for a thing where the, the word itself interprets what a thing is supposed to mean and we're not just making it up, you cannot be dogmatic about it. We can't just make it want to fit what we want. But here we go. <clears throat> It says, and behold, seven heads thin and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them, right? And devoured the heads, uh, the thin, eth, the seven, which are the heads that were fat and full. Literally, mala is to fill up. The melo ha goim is the fullness of the nations, if you will. So it literally means to be full or to fill up. So he woke Pharaoh, and indeed, and behold, it was a dream, meaning he, and he realized he had dreamed, right? And it came to be in the dawn that was troubled. So he was vexed, right, to thrust or impel. There we go. So he was impelled in his ruach, and he sent and called for, and he called at all the magicians an engraver or writer. Remember, spell casting. I know people, they, they hear these things, but they don't really put it together. Spell books, they, they write these things, runes and, engra and engravings for magical incantation, Kabbalah. They use the, the Babylonian Hebrew inscriptions for runes, just like they'd use the runic texts for magic incantations, which was writings they scribble stuff and draw pictures and do things that's what this is about right <clears throat> people don't have an idea really what it means to be a magician but these people do stuff like that for power okay what they can do and how they're allowed to do things you know is different and there's varieties but how they do it is right here and you can see them still carry through with that kind of stuff today so when he called for eth all the magicians or the inscriptors the engravers of egypt or mitzrayim and with all the wise men the hokmim right and told pharaoh lahem unto them eth his dreams and none wa ein that's where we get ain't right ain't gonna happen well, Ein could interpret Othem, right, them, unto Pharaoh. And spoke the chief or prince of the cupbearers, Eth, to Pharaoh, and said, Eth, my faults or my sin, that Hate, Hate is my sin. Okay? Hata is literally a sin, an offense um, to miss right? To go wrong. It literally means to miss the mark, right? When you look at that word um, in a simple picture, it's the tomb, the stone, and our prince behind it. That That is where your, your arrow is not getting to it. It's missing the mark, and that's the reason why he had to die, right? But then you have the word for an arrow, and it's like going right into the Kadosh Kodeshim, with the picture that you can see in the letters there. You'll have to dig into it. It's, it was one of the first um, word pictures I'd actually seen for myself when I was looking in the Strongs and just writing things down on a piece of paper. Um, I might still have that as a bookmark, actually, in my Strongs Concordance. I'll have to find that. But anyways, he it says, It's my sin. I remember this day. Now, I remember now this day right pharaoh was angry with me or with upon his servants and put me in the custody right the aleph town me in the custody of the house of the prince of the guards eth me wa eth the prince of the bakers and we each 
had, right, a dream. So, and we each dreamed in the night one, right? I and he, men, or it says each of us, I and he, men, according to the interpretation of his own, of his dream. We dreamed, we dreamed, right? Our dreams. And there with us, a young man, that Na'ar is a youth, a, a young man. It's not someone who is a, a man, but uh, not quite of age. Okay. This is particularly used in uh, the Proverbs for the young man lacking heart, where that wanton woman finds him in the night and then uh, has her way with him. And he goes like an ox to the slaughter. So, but that's the youth's right here very worthwhile to look into how that applies to people but it says and there was with us a youth a hebrew servant of under the prince of the guards and he recounted or and we recounted unto him and he interpreted unto us eth our dreams man his own dream so each man his dream he interpreted and it came to be as which he interpreted unto us ken hia surely truly thus the yaw it it existed right it came to be me he restored to upon my office and him he hanged and Washilak, and he sent Pharaoh, and he called at Yahusuf, and they brought him quickly. Wayritzun, right? That aretz, the, the word for land, the earth, is Aleph Resh Zaudi, right? Aretz. And it also can mean, I will run the course set before me, or and this is, he brought him quickly. That Resh Zaudi is literally a courier or a messenger, a runner, right? To roots is to run, right? So Aretz is the, I will run the course, right? It is the runner or the one who's running that. Does youth always mean age or could it mean maturity also, Na'ar? Um, that's an excellent question. I'm not going to be uh, dogmatic about that because I'd say we should look over every usage of it in his word to find out exactly what that is is meaning. And that way we don't have to guess. Um, I'm pretty much that way with all of these things. And if we ever had time and we were doing studies, that's what we'd do. I would go through here. I'd click on this, for example. And then you can see all the, the mentions in Bereshit, the lad, the lad, the voice of the lad, and who is speaking, the house both young and old, right? And then you can also go and find every occurrence, all 240 of them, and literally go through and see how it's used in every single instance and not have to, to guess, right? Now, um, I'll be honest, a young man in the time, for example, Josephus, when he was writing the antiquities of the Yahudim and the wars of the Yahudim, in those translations, he uses youth and young men for people who are, are <clears throat> a lot older than I am, and I'm 42. So um, the concept there was that men at the at the time of the beginning, we're living for 900 years, and people that were only a few hundred years old were young. They're youths, comparatively. And that's the premise behind, if you look at the patriarchs, most of them did not wed and or have children until uh, they were in their hundreds. When you look at the Septuagint, the Book of Yobelim, and um, the Samaritan Pentateuch, Josephus, the dates for when they actually had children was significantly longer than later on in time. But that's not for right now anyways. So I would recommend going over and doing a word study with that one to know for sure. 
but I can't answer off the top of my head. <clears throat> it says, and he sent Pharaoh and he called Eth Yahusuf, and they brought him or they ran from the dungeon, right? And he shaved and changed his clothing and came. This is something that's significant to us, okay? Especially for America and Britain, with if you look at Fourth Ezra and the three headed eagle, right? It has to do with that era of the fourth, fourth beast reign. The fourth beast kingdom from Daniel's visions is the kingdom of the Roman Empire. It was in, elucidated in more detail in Fourth Ezra, where you have the beginnings of the reign of the feathers with the line of the Caesars that were reigning. The second being um, Augustus, who was the longest reigning Caesar, and then going through there, through the emperors and Heredian, uh, Constantine, and then eventually the schisms, the fightings, and the fall and reemergence as the papacy is all covered in 4th Ezra. And then it also goes into detail about the awakening of the heads of the beast and the of what that represents. That has to do with these times as well, with Ephraim and Manasseh, typified of Yahusuf, who was inheriting the birthright covenants. The great nation of what America became and the company of nations, literally the British Commonwealth, of what they were known for, and specifically how they were used. If you remember, we've talked about how foretellings are inverted the things that seem beneficial and, and nice on one end is later perverted or flipped around in a different sense. This is exactly what you can see in Yahusuf here and then how his children have been used later on. So, Ob willing, you really get a grip on that as we go, but it should be more clear as we go through the course of things and you'll see experimentally in time. If you don't know that Britain is, a, is Ephraim generally, the commonwealth and that Menashe or the half tribe of Menashe is America, then this stuff might seem right over your head. But please bear with me. Just take the narrative of the story here in mind and then it, keep in mind the actual historical events of what have happened. The British Empire was subverted by the high church party, which was Jesuit. They used the Oxford movement the Tractation Movement, which was a known Jesuit plot to take over their religion and country again. And then they'd use them and uh, their empire for their drug trades with the opium, for example, the East Indian Trading Company. It's something that they would later do with the CIA, and they still do today. There is a book called Operation Gladio by Paul L. Williams, who talks about the CIA the Vatican and the Mafia and how they've been since the inception of the CIA, which was always a Jesuit organization. They funded that entire thing through peddling drugs, the same thing they've done since their inception. But that, that's a different thing, thing for another time. The point is the British Empire has been used by Rome to subvert and subdue the world back to them. And their time has passed. That head is no longer prevalent. And you have America that's been being used for that purpose since then. These are the literal fulfillments of this foretelling. This is the physical in the first essence of it. And this, what we've lived through, what we're living through is the spiritual application, the fullness of that literally being done. To, and I want to, see, I want to show you the power in this. Everyone in the military right now has to shave their heads, shave their beards, change their clothes, and do these very things where they're for this service. It is literally what's being done, and it was foretold in our ancestor or in the patriarch, Yahusuf, right here. So, Father willing, you can see these things. Um, it's not a, it's not bad. It's so that we can take comfort that our Creator knows everything that is, right. But it says, and he sent Pharaoh and called Eth Yahusuf, and he quickly brought him out of the dungeon. He shaved and changed his clothing. And he came to Pharaoh, and he said, Pharaoh, to Yahusuf, 
a dream I have dreamed. Cholom cholomi or cholom ti. Sorry. And interpret nine, ein, none, it, right? It says, eth, o, right? And that wall there, excuse me, literally means him because there's no gender neutral in the Hebrew. But because we don't speak like that in English or in the Greek, they have gender neutrals. They just translate it as it. So there is a distinction. They do have feminine versions of that as well. It's not it's not as prevalent, but it is used on occasion. Okay. It says, and I, or but I, that walk can be and but any kind of conjunction, right? And I have heard of you upon you unto it said, right? That you comprehend, Tashima, right? You hear the dream unto interpretation or to interpret it, right? Eth, it. And he replied, Yahusif, eth, Pharaoh, unto saying, be, um, it is not me that this word right here, bele, is close to the word for like bele all, is literally without worth. But this one is it is not me. So there's literally without, except or apart from. Okay. So he's saying it is not of me, or it is not from me. But Elohim will reply or answer you, f. Shalom, Pharaoh, or with Shalom. And he said, or and the Debar, or the matter of Pharaoh, to Yahusuf, in my dream, Hini, right? Behold, I stood on the bank of the river, and suddenly out of the river came up seven cows, fat of flesh and beautiful, Yafit, right? And pretty, fair looking right fair to look upon they say and they fed among the reeds and behold seven cows other came up or came upon after them poor thin and evil or bad looking right this is favored but this is the same word right here or excuse me, it's the same word right here, Tau, Aleph, Resh, right? Here it's looking, there they say favored. But looking exceedingly, so they're thin and evil looking exceedingly. That ma'od, ma'od is translated as very, it means muchness, <laughs> muchness, if that's even a word in English, but it means to be... Uh, that that's how you'd express it your your bright effort and then literally in german mod is a, is a female warrior or a mighty in battle is to be ma maod it's a it's a woman's name in german still to this day i have an ancestor that was named that and it comes right from this word right here but when he says it was very good in the beginning it was tov maod for example. Sorry about that. And it is favored looking. And it says, and never. And behold, seven cows, other came up after them. They were thin and evil looking exceedingly or greatly. And this doesn't even have the connection of it says and rakut this word right here is thin only surely or altogether is rack this word also means to be thin to be fine it's to turn the face away also yeah altogether or surely but it says and be oh i'm sorry it says and the thin grunt or the flin flesh did never I have seen such as these in all the land of Egypt. 
So he's saying the thinness of their flesh, right? He'd never seen the like of in all the land of Egypt. Unto evil. This says for ugliness, but it's literally unto evil. And ate up the cows that are grown and ugly at the seven, the cows, the first, the fat. And they had devoured to among them, and no one would have known that they had devoured them among them, for they were evil. It says ugly, right? But it says, for they were evil. Now, evil because they ate and didn't get fat. They were thin and, and, and it was evil or bad. And the feeding, the fattening up, they ate the grass, they ate the cows, and they didn't fill up. So it's evil to him. It says, just as at the beginning. So they ate them and they didn't get bigger. They were still just as evil. Then I awoke, and I saw in my dream, and suddenly, this is another one, and I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on stock one, full and tov, and tovoth, right, and good, or pleasant, and behold, seven heads withered and thin, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and devoured the heads, the thin, at the seven, the heads that were good. So I told to the magicians or the engravers, but none, Megid, could, in, could explain or could expound. That word Gid is literally like Nagad, is to be high and conspicuous. Yeah, to be in your face, Nagad. Um, it's like, ah, nana, 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 you know, someone doing that right in front of you. That's kind of the picture of what Nagad is. So no one can ah, just bring it to his attention like that, is what he's saying. Unto me. And yes, I literally, the idea that comes to mind with that word is the nagad is high and inconspicuous. Like in your face, you can't, you can't miss it ah, because it's not always a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a beneficial thing, but not always. And it's the, uh, like you can see what it says in Proverbs about it, like the life and death are before Yahuwah and Nagad, so is how much more the uh, works of the sons of men, for example, and things of that nature. But it's a very interesting word. So, And there was no one who could bring it conspicuous to me. And said Yahusuf, or and he said Yahusuf to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh Ahad are one. He which, or they are with what the Elohim assay. So what they work, it's what the Elohim do or make. Han Gid, he has made it conspicuous unto Pharaoh. So what Pharaoh's asking for, Yahus is saying, Elohim, the Elohim, has made what will be conspicuous to you. And he's going to plainly state what it is. Okay? So the seven cows, the good seven years, right? And the seven heads of grain, right? The seven heads are good seven years, right? That's what they are. The dreams are one. And the seven cows, thin and ugly, or thin and evil, which came up after them, seven years are and the seven heads empty and blighted or thin and blighted by the east wind are the seven years of famine famine or hunger ra'av okay that or who literally he but he the thing, or he the matter which I have spoken, right, to Pharaoh. It says, this is the matter which I have spoken to Pharaoh. What the Elohim do, he is shown, right, the hara, right, is the showing at Pharaoh. 
basically he's saying and the thing that Elohim's about to do he is shown unto you right indeed seven years will come plenty of great throughout or in all the land of Mitzrayim but will arise and will stand seven years of famine after them and will be forgotten all the plenty or all the seven or satisfaction which is what Shiva, remember that's that word for seven, the same word for seven, which is plenty here. Shiva for plenty is also and seven. Shiva, seven. So same spelling, two different meanings of it. But to be full, to be plentiful is to be seven or to have an oath or is to swear and be to be satisfied. These are all related terms. And it says, and it will be forgotten all the plenty in the land of Mitzrayim and will deplete, excuse me. It says, and will deplete the famine at the land. And not he will be no, and not he will know the plenty in the land. From the face of the famine that follows after, that Ahri, that comes after. Thus, surely can, for it says kavod, they say severe, but that means kavod is esteem. That's that word we get for esteem, or they say glory, but it also means to be heavy. And in this case, heavy as in severe. But for severe or heavy, he exceedingly, meaning the famine will be exceedingly bad, right? And upon was repeated the dream to Pharaoh twice, right? Two times for Nikun, right? For it is established, it is sure, it is true, it is thus, it is to be firm. He does it, he repeats it. So that by the witness of two, it is confirmed, right? That's one of the, this is the foundation of where this principle is laid down for us. But it is established, ha dabar, or the matter from uh, me m, it says by, but literally with, m is with the Elohim. And will shortly the Elohim bring it to pass, or he will do it, right? At this time, and at this time, you see Pharaoh, a man discerning and wise, and set him, or, and place him, that word set, right, for appointed, is literally where we get the word set, right here. But they don't, they don't normally translate that, so where you can see it very clearly. However, that's where that word comes from. But, and he appointed him over the land of Mitzrayim. And he did, he said, let do Pharaoh and let him appoint officers, right? These are overseers, the Pekad, Pekadim. And he would appoint Pekadim, overseers, upon the land. A physical with the physical with the, the bread and the wheat and the bringing in all of these things to teach us spiritual later on. Okay. It says to take a fifth eth of the, from the land of Egypt in seven years of the plenty and let them gather <clears throat> eth all the food of the years of the good that are coming. Ha Allah of these, right? The these and store up grain or bar under the hand of Pharaoh, food in the cities to be preserved or to be guarded him, right? That shall be the food unto a reserve. But this is unto the pekidun, the visitation. It says, oh, this is a depositor store. So the oversight of the place that would be overseen okay
in the land or of the land for seven years. All right, is of the famine. It says, which shall be, literally, which is to behold or what will be beheld in the land of Mitzrayim. That not may perish to cut off or cut down karat, right? And they not may perish the land in the famine, okay? It says, and so was good the advice or the matter, the words in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And he said, Pharaoh, to his servants, can we find or is there finding as this man which the Ruach of Elohim in him? And said Pharaoh to Yahusuf, Akri, after you've shown, right, after you've this knowledge, since you've already done it, right, since you've shown Elohim, you, at all this, this is broken because it's backwards in how we say things, but since Elohim has shown you all this, is how we'd say it in English, right? Ein, there's none as discerning and wise as you. Okay? As you is kamuka, right? To be who, the one of the things is who is like you is a phrase that's all over the, the Psalms, but it's literally mikamuka in Hebrew. So it, sounds, it kind of sounds funny to us, but Mika Muka is who is like you. That's how I was first familiar with that phraseology there. Anyways, this is F or Ata. It says, you shall be over or upon my house and over, or it says, and by or and upon your word shall be ruled all my people. Rack. It says, only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And said Pharaoh to Yahusuf, see, I have put eth you upon all the land of Mitzrayim, or over all the land of Mitzrayim. And he took Pharaoh eth his signet ring from off or from upon his finger, and he put eth it right upon the hand of Yahusuf, and he clothed at him in garments of bagid, right? Shish, this is fine linen. But he put him in garments of fine linen, and he put there a chain of gold around his neck. And he had ride him in chariot the second. So he rode him in the second chariot, which he had unto him, and they cried before him, Bow the knee. So he set at him upon or over all the land of Mitzrayim and said, Pharaoh to Yahusuf, Ani Pharaoh, I'm Pharaoh, which if you don't know, you can find this out in the um, Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons as well. But this is the same word as we get in hero for in English today, or the ha ro, the pay the is the same as the ha in Hebrew, which is the definite article, which would be the, and then ra'a or ro here is a shepherd. So the hero of antiquity was the mighty hunter among uh, before Yahuwah, Nimrod, the great shepherd or subduer of the, the, the wild beasts and shepherd of men is what he was called. He was called the hero. And Pharaoh just took that title and in, in to Egypt with them. So he was the Pharaoh, which was their title for their king. But anyways, it says, I am the Pharaoh or the, uh, the shepherd and apart from you, not may lift a man at his hand or at his foot, that rag low. Remember regel, where we get regular regulation, regalia, um, all those Resh Gimel Lamed related words, including Regulus, the star from the foot of the lion in, in the constellations there, it all comes from the Hebrew Resh Gimel Lamed, meaning a foot or the path that you follow, right? 
And he says, no one's going to put his hand or his foot in all the land of Mitzrayim. Basically making Yahusuf second to him in everything. Giving him command. And called Pharaoh Shem, the name of Yahusuf, Zephnath Paneach. Right? This is also translated. We'll get to it eventually. But there's a book where someone put it in English. In the Greek, this is where you get the Greek word for Phoenix from. Okay? But this says the L the L speaks and he lives, right? But Zephnath Paneach, that Paneach is its own word. And it literally is where they get the word for Phoenix in Greek. But it is the revealer of secrets. This is to decode or interpret, to hide or to decode. And then um, Paneach, right? The later on when the Greeks like uh, Cadmus, Calcol, uh, Zera, when they were founding the city-states in Greece, Attica, and Phoenicia, for example, one of Mahol's sons from Phoenicia was named Phoenix, and that's where they got the name from. And now you know. This is, and he called Pharaoh the name of Yahuzef, Zeph, Zeph, uh, sorry, Zephnath Paneach, and he gave him Eth Asnath, the daughter of Pontifar, the Kohen of On, or the priest of On, as a wife or as a woman. So went out Yahusuf upon the land of Mitzrayim. And Yahusuf was 30 years old, right? When he stood before Pharaoh, that about 30 years old was when our Mashiach started in ministry as well. It's when a man comes of age, and it's when a mind is fully developed. About 25 to 30 is when your frontal lobe is fully developed, and a man is able to comprehend cognitively and through experience what foresight is. Before, you cannot really comprehend it. You can get an idea, but it's superficial. These things are actually known in science today, but it's not fully explained. Um, oops, that's more for another time, however. This is in Yahusu was about 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Mitzrayim, and went out Yahusu from the face of Pharaoh and went and he crossed over, right? In all the land of Mitzrayim. And brought forth from the ground of the land in the seven years plentiful, hasava or fullness, abundantly closed at hand or fist, right? To, to have your closed fist or a handful, meaning it was filled up, right? So he gathered at all the food of seven years, which were in the land of Mitzrayim, and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field. In, It says in every city, but it says the food of the field in the city, all right, which surrounded them, meaning they would build these cities and locations and from the immediate fields around them, they would fill them up, yeah? And he laid up, or and he put in the midst of, and he gathered Yahusuf grain like the sand. That is a very interesting word there, but we'll look at it later. Like the sand of the sea, very much, right? And this is harava. This is exceedingly or plentiful, exceedingly. This is very much or very exceedingly, right? Until that or for he stopped counting. So he, he did it so much that he, he lost count, right? For it was not able to count. Ki ein misafar. Misfar, right? Or mispar, they say there. And unto Yahusuf were born two sons before came the years of famine. Okay. Whom bore unto him Asnath, the daughter of Pontifar, Kohen of On, priest of On, who was a sun worshiper, just so you know. 
And he called Yahusuf Eth the name of the firstborn, Menashe, causing to forget. Okay. <clears throat> For Nishini, he has made me forget Elohim Eth all my toil and all the house of my father. Now, in reverse, think of the contrast. It is the famines that are being brought on that will cause Menashe to remember through toil who we are. So, uh, willing, this will make more sense to you guys. It says, and the name of the second he called or Kara Ephraim, Ki or for he is caused Ha Perini, perini right? That Peru or free, this is fruitful. And that's what Ephraim means is to be fruitful. For he has caused Elohim in the land. He's caused me to be fruitful, Elohim, in the land of my affliction. And that is something that we've already seen prevalent. As the people are afflicted, so they increase and multiply, right? It's a theme that keeps happening again and again through history. As we go through it, the more you'll see. But if you've been tracking or following along with any of that, the northern kingdom taken out into captivity became an innumerable multitude not to be numbered, as by Josephus' witness in 90 AD. So uh, just by that, innumerable couldn't be counted beyond the Euphrates until now. And then we know it happened from the 90s to the 400s with the spreading out, the, the more vast migrations and the eventual um, funneling into Europe, the fall of Rome from the paganized uh, Hebrews, and the rise of the Ten Kingdoms, the fall of three of which brought about the rise of the Little Horn in that beast kingdom as mentioned in Daniel, right? <clears throat> it says, and ended the seven years of the plenty, which were in the land of Mitzrayim, and began, right, the seven years of the famine, or of the evil, right, that's the famine, sorry, to come, which was like, or, or according as he said, Yahusuf, and behold, or and it came to be the famine in all the lands, that was the plural of them, right? All the lands. But in all the land of Mitzrayim, there was lechem, there was bread. So when was famished all the land of Mitzrayim, then cried Ha'am, the people, to Pharaoh for bread, or unto bread. And he said, Pharaoh, to all the Mitzrayim, Laku, go to Yahusuf, whatever he says to you, do. And the famine was upon all the face of the land. And he opened Yahusuf at all which in them. It says storehouses, but that isn't the word, that's Asher. But he says, and he opened all which in them, and he sold to unto the Mitzrayims, right, Mitzrayims. And became severe. Now, sorry, he sold unto them. Okay, he could have given it to them. Or if people had been frugal, they could have kept some for themselves. But that wasn't done. However, they did acquire a lot of money during those times. And then they, they used that money first, right? But after the money, what happens? That's the thing. But he sold to the Egyptians and became, okay, it says, and became severe the famine in the land of Mitzrayim. So all countries came into Mitzrayim to buy unto Yahusuf, or to Yahusuf, because was severe the famine in all the land. All right. And um, that might be where we have to leave off for today, and we'll have to continue next week with our, our reading, but we'll see how that is. If so, um, you all have a wonderful Shabbat and Shavuot Tov, and we will see you next time.